Well, thank you for that introduction uh, and for the invitation to participate in the Presidential Biographers series. I think what historians want above all else is an audience, whether it's uh, students or readers or uh, people that are simply interested in history. Uh, it's audiences like this that make what we do worthwhile. So Alex, thank you for the, the invitation and the introduction and thank all of you for being here. Uh, when you write a book about a president, you have to ask yourself at some step in the process whether the book is really necessary. Uh, any president has been the subject of dozens, maybe hundreds of books. Um, right now, Times Books is publishing a, a series of books on each of the presidents. Uh, the Times series focuses on their presidential years. About 10 years ago, Gary Wills wrote the Times book on Madison, and Wills, of course, has won a couple of Pulitzer Prizes and other prestigious awards. He's published a lot of books. Uh, very distinguished author. Uh, the Times series is not illustrated, but at the front of each book, there's a picture of that uh, president. And at the front of the, uh, the Madison book is, I've got a poster here, at the front of the Madison book, is a picture, you can't see it, you have to take my word for it, is a picture of James Monroe. Now, <laughs> uh, now, I'm sure Gary Wills knows what James Madison looks like. The picture was probably selected by an intern. And, and in fairness to Times, uh, Times book, they corrected the mistake in the, in the later printings. But it occurred to me when I saw that picture that if a major publisher is publishing a book about James Madison and they're not quite sure what Madison looks like, well then Madison's not as well known as he ought to be and I should go ahead and write my book about James Madison <laughs> and, try, and try, to get, try to get the Madison story, the Madison story out. Uh, Madison's tenure in the Oval Office uh, didn't help his reputation. Uh, one of the two or three things most people remember about Madison is he wasn't a, a terribly successful president, or that's what, that's what they tell me when I, when I tell them I've written a book about Madison. The other thing they remember is he was married to Dolly Madison. Uh, she may be better known than he was. I think the, uh, the popular mythology may exaggerate uh, Madison's low standing among historians. Uh, in 2009, C-SPAN uh, polled 65 historians, and they rated Madison number 20 out of 42 presidents. That put him in the average range as presidents go, uh, just behind John Quincy Adams and just ahead of Grover Cleveland. Not terrible company, I don't think. Uh, in 2001, Siena College in New York published a survey of 238 presidential scholars, and, and, and Siena does this, this survey every, every few years. And in the 2011 survey, uh, Madison actually finished number six among historians. Uh, and on one criteria, intelligence, he was rated number two, our second most intelligent president. His very best friend, Thomas Jefferson, was ranked number one on the presidential IQ scale. Uh, but the Siena poll may be a, a bit of an aberration, and sixth place for Madison does seem a little bit high. Uh, Madison is among a tiny handful of presidents whose place in history depends mainly on what he did before he became president. Uh, next to George Washington, Madison, I think, and I say this in the book, may have been the most indispensable of the, of the founders. Over a period of about 50 years, he compiled a remarkable list of accomplishments. Uh, no one, for example, did more for the cause of religious liberty. Uh, his friend Jefferson considered the Virginia statute for religious freedom to be his, Jefferson's greatest accomplishment. And it's true that Jefferson wrote the Virginia statute for, for religious freedom, but it was Madison who actually pushed it through the Virginia assembly and, 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 and turned it into law. Madison's best remembered today as the father of the Constitution. And I think that title owes less to his influence on the text of the document uh, than it does uh, on his, uh, the critical role that he played at every step in the process of constitutional reform. Uh, Madison served as a delegate to the Annapolis Convention that recommended holding a federal constitutional convention. He drafted a resolution in the Virginia Assembly which endorsed the proposal of the Annapolis Convention. Uh, he wrote the law authorizing the appointment of Virginia's delegates to the Philadelphia Convention. And he persuaded a very reluctant George Washington to serve as a member of the delegation. And luring the, the old general uh, out of retirement, 
um, really gave the Constitutional Convention a legitimacy that I think otherwise it would have lacked. Um, and then in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787, Madison wrote most of the Virginia Plan, which provided a starting point for the Convention's debates. Uh, in explaining the origins of the Constitutional Convention, textbooks that typically stress the weaknesses of the national government under the Articles of Confederation. Uh, under the Articles, Congress uh, couldn't levy taxes, so it couldn't pay the debt that the United States had incurred during the American Revolution. It couldn't regulate foreign trade, which meant it couldn't retaliate against countries, mainly Great Britain, that discriminated against American commerce. Uh, and those shortcomings bothered Madison, but one of the things that I learned working on the book is that he was more worried about the lack of any effective check on state governments. And he had a long list of complaints against, against the state governments. What I think appalled him most was the state's practice of printing their own paper money. Uh, the, the state money uh, lost value, depreciated quickly, it stimulated inflation, and it drove hard currency out of circulation. Um, and among the various solutions that Madison proposed to this misbehavior by the states was to give Congress the power to veto state laws, and he called this the congressional negative. The other delegates rejected the congressional negative, but Madison's Virginia plan helped nudge them toward a complete revision of the Articles of Confederation. Uh, Madison also kept the most complete notes on the debates in the Philadelphia Convention so that most of what we know about the convention comes from his notes, another contribution he made to the process. And then during the fight over the ratification of the Constitution in the winter of 1787 and 1788, uh, Madison co-authored the Federalist Papers, probably the single most cogent uh, explanation we have of the thinking behind the Constitution. Uh, the most famous of his Federalist essays is Federalist Number 10, in which he lays out probably the most innovative idea in the history of American political thought. Since antiquity, political philosophers had thought that Republican states, republics, had to be small so all the citizens would share a common interest. And America's large size made the United States a poor candidate, theoretically, for Republican governments. But in Federalist Number 10, Madison turned the conventional thinking on its head. Uh, he argued that if you extended the sphere, the language he used, you would take in more factions, or what we would call interest groups. And he said that the competition among these various interest groups would create an informal system of checks and balances that would help protect individual liberties. And Madison thought that he'd seen the beneficial effects of factions or interest groups in Virginia. Uh, he thought, and this was one thing that surprised me, I thought it was a little humorous when I, I discovered this working on the book, he thought that the reason Virginia had been able to end state support for the churches is because each church uh, worried th that its rival denominations would benefit unfairly uh, when the public dollars were doled out. The churches didn't trust each other, and that eventually uh, killed the idea of st state support of the churches in Virginia. Um, uh, then at the Virginia Convention, which was called to consider ratification of the Constitution in June of 1788, um, uh, Madison led the Constitution supporters against a very formidable uh, anti-federalist opposition that included people like Patrick Henry and George Mason. And then after the Constitution had been approved by enough states to take effect, Madison really single-handedly, and I think it's not much of an exaggeration to say single-handedly, pushed the Bill of Rights through Congress. Uh, Madison supported amendments to protect fundamental civil liberties as a way to appease or placate the more moderate critics of the Constitution and to win them over because he understood that to survive, this new government would need broad popular support. Then later in the 1790s, Madison returned to his seat in the Virginia State Legislature, stayed there for several years, and then when his best friend, Thomas Jefferson, became president in 1801, uh, Jefferson appointed Madison Secretary of State, and he served as Secretary of State until he was elected president and took office in 1809. The War of 1812 dominated Madison's presidency, and uh, America's lackluster performance in the war 
in one of our strangest wars, I think explains why Madison is typically rated in the middle of the presidential pack. And I thought I'd focus tonight, spend the rest of my time, on Madison and the War of 1812, since this is a presidential biographer series, uh, and since we're just beginning the war's bicentennial, uh, just this month. Um, Madison sent his war message to Congress on June 1st, 1812, 200 years ago this month. He began with an attack on impressment. This was the British practice of taking uh, British subjects, or alleged British subjects, off of American ships. Uh, Britain's long war against Napoleon had left the Royal Navy desperate for sailors. They resorted to impressment to, to fill the ranks. Um, and then Madison concluded his sort of recitation of American grievances by suggesting, not quite blaming the British, but suggesting that they were responsible for what he called the warfare just renewed by the savages on one of our extensive frontiers, blame the, the, the British for inciting the Indian Wars. But in between, in between, Madison spent most of his time complaining about uh, British restrictions on American trade with France and France's allies. A combination of American diplomacy and economic sanctions had brought no relief. And so on June 4th, a divided, a very divided House of Representatives passed a declaration of war. On June 13th, an equally divided Senate passed a declaration. And then on June 18th, Madison signed the official declaration of war against Great Britain. He didn't know, and this is one of the strange facts about the War of 1812, he didn't know that two days earlier, the British government had decided to lift their restrictions on American commerce. Uh, suffering through a restriction, or uh, recession, suffering through a recession, the British had concluded that the restoration of normal trade with the United States might revive their economy. Madison said later that he wouldn't have gone to war if he had known about the change in British policy. But this problem of impressment and a general animosity toward the British, and really in Madison's case, I think something left over from the American Revolution, this general animosity toward the British, and the general slow pace of early 19th century diplomacy kept the war going for two and a half years. And so Madison stumbled into a war that didn't go very well, and modern historians have not been very kind to him. Uh, a series of American misadventures culminated in the burning of Washington, D.C., by in the, the Capitol and the White House, by British troops in August of 1814. Now, that particular disaster uh, began with a very strained relationship between Madison and his Secretary of War, a uh, fairly cant cantankerous uh, New Yorker named John Armstrong. Um, Armstrong is one of those characters that's sort of forgotten to history, but in his day, Armstrong was a well-known public figure, and he had presidential ambitions. Uh, now, James Monroe uh, was uh, one of Madison's fellow Virginians, was Secretary of State, and Monroe also had presidential ambitions. And it was fairly obvious that Madison hoped to be succeeded in the White House by, or that Madison hoped to be succeeded in the White House by Monroe, and Armstrong resented that. So I think that was part of the, the, the part of the reason for the tension between between Madison and Armstrong. Now, the the, the British uh, British Admiral George Cockburn had led raids in the Chesapeake region in the summer of 1813, and uh, in the spring of 1814, Madison expected the British to return to the Chesapeake. And in May of 1814, he ordered Armstrong to begin to, pre to, to prepare and prove Washington's defenses. And Armstrong just basically ignored the order. Um, and then on, uh, at a cabinet meeting on July 1st, uh, Madison predicted, uh, the, predicted that the British would attack Washington. But Armstrong disagreed. Armstrong thought that Baltimore or Annapolis were much more likely targets. And there was a sort of logic to, 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 to Armstrong's analysis. Uh, Baltimore and Annapolis in 1814 were much larger and more commercially important cities than Washington, D.C. was. So in, in some ways, they, they were more logical targets. Um, and there were some cynics who thought that Armstrong might have ul ulterior motives. Uh, I'm not sure I believe this, but at least these were, these were sort, of the, this sort of the rumors in 1814. 
that, uh, that he thought that if the British were to destroy Washington, it would create an opportunity to move the capital back to the north and maybe to New York City. Um, and, there, and, and people were still debating, uh, even though Washington was supposed to be the permanent capital. That was still a sort of a manner of debate in the early 1800s. Well, under pressure from Madison, the War Department creates something called the 10th Military District to defend the capital. Armstrong wanted to uh, give the command of the 10th District to General Moses Porter, who was a distinguished veteran of the American Revolution and an old uh, Indian fighter. Uh, but Madison overruled him and made a political appointment. Uh, it appointed a Baltimore lawyer named William Winder. Uh, Winder's military experience uh, consisted mainly of getting himself captured. He'd been, he'd been captured by the British at the Battle of Stony Creek uh, that I don't know much about. I think it's, 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 it's basically known for that's where Winder was captured. It was near Niagara, New York. Uh, he was captured there in June of 1813. He was exchanged um, for a British officer later. Um, uh, Winder wasn't much of a general, but Madison had reasons for, for uh, uh, preferring Winder, and, and this sort of suggests a larger point I'm going to get to in a minute. The defense of Washington would depend heavily on the support of the, Mar the Maryland militia. The regular army only had a few hundred soldiers in the Washington area in the summer of 1814, and Winder's uncle was the governor of Maryland. And Madison thought that family connection would ensure Maryland's support in the defense of the capital. Well, Winder spent most of his time inspecting terrain without really accomplishing very much. Now, there was a cartographer, a map maker in the War Department, who predicted that the defense of Washington, if the British came, would hinge on the little Maryland town of Bladensburg. Um, Bladensburg was on the eastern branch of the Potomac River. There was a bridge there, but also the river was, was, was low enough, uh, shallow enough there to, for, to ford uh, even, uh, even, if, uh, even without the bridge. And there were two roads at Bladensburg. One led to Georgetown, and the other road led to Washington, D.C. But Winder had no real strategy and built no uh, defenses. Uh, and Armstrong, the Secretary of War, did not want to pay for a general mobilization of the militia uh, any sooner than he had to. He was going to wait till he saw the Redcoats before he call, called up the militia. But finally, on July 12th, uh, Winder is given authority to, uh, to uh, call up uh, about 6,000 Maryland militiamen. Now, to complicate matters, about the middle of August, Armstrong and Madison had a really ugly confrontation. This had to do with Armstrong's practice of doing things like reorganizing regiments and promoting officers and issuing general military regulations without consulting the president. And Madison called him in and, and really call, called him on the carpet for some of the unilateral decisions that Armstrong had made. And it appears after that confrontation that Armstrong decided he wouldn't do anything, he wouldn't do anything without a direct order from Madison. And he didn't do anything uh, to support Winder. Well, he didn't do anything, but he did assign an, ad an adjutant, an aide, to Winder's staff, and he gave him a chaplain. I thought he, I guess he thought uh, uh, Winder might need divine intervention before things were over. He did give him a chaplain. Um, and then, uh, on August 15th, just a few days after this, this confrontation between Madison and Armstrong, British transport ships carrying about over 4,000 troops, commanded by General Robert Ross, uh, passed through the Virginia Capes uh, to meet British warships under this Admiral Cockburn. On August 18, three days later, Madison received news of the approach of this British fleet. And the next day, Ross and Cockburn began disembarking troops uh, at Benedict, uh, uh, Maryland. Um, and it, when, when that word reached Washington, uh, James Monroe left uh, the capital with about two dozen cavalrymen to begin scouting the, the British troop movements. Now, I think the fact that the Secretary of State would take on an assignment that could have probably been handled by a second lieutenant uh, suggests something about how disorganized the, uh, the national government was. Well, Madison found, uh, I'm sorry, Monroe, Monroe found the British landing site 
and he watched the Redcoats as they began to move north on August 21st. Madison ordered a general mobilization of the militia. They'd been trying to avoid that as long as they could. But Madison ordered a general mobilization of the militia the next day, August 22nd, and he ordered Dolly Madison to begin to prepare for the evacuation of the lighthouse. Well, the Americans remained uncertain of the British intentions, but Ross and Cockburn had decided to attack the capital. Now, Washington could be approached from, uh, most directly from the south, across uh, over two bridges, across the Anacostia River. But the British assumed that those bridges would be heavily defended or destroyed, and eventually the Americans did blow them up. So the invaders decided to take a longer, a more indirect route. Ross and Cockburn would cross the Potomac at Bladensburg, just as the War Department's photographer had predicted, and approach Washington from the north, northeast. Well, by the morning of August 24th, it was clear the British were headed toward Bladensburg. Uh, Winder managed to rush a, a motley force to the town, cavalry, uh, sailors, marines, army regulars, and militia from Maryland and from the District of Columbia. Uh, and despite the improvised nature of the American defenses, Madison and the Americans had some reason to be optimistic. They actually outnumbered the British. Uh, they had artillery and cavalry, and the British didn't. Uh, and the lay of the land was such the Americans were going to be defending the high ground as the British came across the, came across the, 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 the river. Well, on the morning of the 24th, the local, local American commander at Bladensburg arranged his men in three lines. Monroe, James Monroe, reached Bladensburg uh, before any other senior official, and he redeployed the lines. And he inadvertently uh, uh, separated the men so the three lines wouldn't be able to support one another. Uh, Mass and Armstrong and Winder reached the scene shortly before the battle began, but none of them provided much leadership or strategic direct direction, although I did come across uh, one uh, uh, interesting quote from Winder. Uh, he allegedly told one artillery uh, sergeant that, uh, uh, this is a quote, when you retreat, uh, take note, you must retreat by the Georgetown Road. Uh, so when you retreat, go this way. Okay. Okay. Uh, when the British uh, crossed the bridge, they took heavy casualties before the first line of American defenders fell back. And then the officers in the second line ordered retreat. The Americans might have reformed along the third line, where, uh, which was anchored by a, a naval commander, Josiah Barney, uh, and a group of naval uh, gunners. They might have, but Barney said later that he was cruelly disappointed that they had not. Uh, they just kept going. By 2 o'clock, uh, Madison who'd ridden on horseback to the rear of the American lines, uh, received news that the battle was lost, and Ross and Cockburn entered Washington later that day. The American defeat had not been inevitable. With proper leadership, American troops won other battles in the War of 1812. Uh, Andrew Jackson's victory at the Battle of New Orleans is probably the, the best known example. But there's another American success story that's not very well known that I think makes a more interesting comparison. It involves a man named Samuel Smith, another character important in his day who's sort of been lost to history. Samuel Smith was a 62-year-old veteran of the American Revolution. Uh, he was a United States senator and a major general in the Maryland militia. Smith had taken charge of Baltimore's defenses, and in the summer of 1814, when William Winder from the regular army tried to assert command in Baltimore, uh, Smith simply ignored him. Um, now, of course, as we know, Baltimore's inner harbor was guarded by Fort McHenry, but Smith positioned gun batteries and outside the fort, uh, built redoubts around the city. He put gunboats and he sank ships uh, in the harbor to serve as a barrier to the British, British vessels. He did a lot of work to prepare the city for an attack. And in fact, Baltimore had been working for its on its defenses for over a year uh, by the summer of 1814. And then in August of 1814, city leaders formed something called the Committee of Vigilance and Safety. And they drafted, drafted every white man in the city 
between the ages of 16 and 50. And Smith put this conscript army to work digging more trenches and building more defenses, earthworks, around the city. When the British approach Baltimore in September of 1814, uh, Smith has uh, 9,000 men, probably more, at his disposal. Now we remember the, the, uh, the Battle of Baltimore for the failed attack on Fort McHenry. But there was another operation that enjoyed almost equal significance. As the Royal Navy approached Baltimore by sea, a British army advanced on Baltimore by land. Um, and Smith knew that, and he sent about 3,200 men out to North Point, Maryland to intercept the, the British infantry. And when the British and the Americans met up, as the American militia had done at Bladensburg, they retreated when they were charged by British regulars. But they fell back in good order. And in the skirmishing, American snipers killed Ross, the British general. Um, and Ross's death, and he was very popular with his men, his death demoralized the British and delayed the, the advance on Washington, or on Baltimore, sorry. Now, of course, and then when the British saw, you know, as, as, the, as the song goes, by the dawn's early light on September 14th, that the attack on Fort McHenry had failed, they decided to, to abandon the, the, the land attack on the city as well. Okay. This raises a question. Why was the city of Baltimore able to defend itself when the nation's capital couldn't? Well, American forces could win local victories when they were commanded by particularly intrepid generals like Andrew Jackson or Samuel Smith. But in the ordinary course of business, the American state was simply too weak to fight effectively when American soldiers were led by ordinary generals. In the early 1800s, 90% of Americans lived um, on farms or in small towns. They had limited contact with the outside world. Uh, local authorities commanded more respect than did the federal government. The only federal presence in most towns was the post office, if they were lucky enough to have a post office. Once the war began, state militia officers often disputed the authority of regular army officers. Uh, governors would frequently refuse to make uh, state militia available for federal service. And during fighting along the Canadian border, there were repeated instances where state militia refused to enter into, into Canada on the grounds that they could not be deployed outside the United States. And the political ideology that dominated American politics during and, uh, uh, and after the Revolution had made it difficult for the federal government to prepare for war. Uh, Republicans, uh, uh, Madison's political party, uh, saw what they call standing armies, we would call them professional armies, standing armies as a threat to Republican government. Uh, and of course, military preparations required higher taxes. Um, and, but many Americans in those days saw direct taxes as, as almost kind of a violation of their civil liberties. Uh, we know the American Revolution was about taxation without representation, but the truth was Americans didn't like taxation with representation either. That didn't, that didn't, that didn't make it any easier to swallow. Uh, that, 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 turned out, that didn't help that much. So in 1810, the war just two years away, we know that now, an economy-minded Congress voted to reduce the size of the already small Army and Navy. And two years later, in 1812, with the war really imminent, lawmakers reversed course. Uh, and they voted to raise an army of 75,000 men. But despite having over a million men of a military age available, the nation never met the congressional target. Few men wanted to enlist in the regular army. Uh, only about 5% of the men of military age served in the regular army during the War of 1812. Uh, the population of the United States dwarfed the Canadian population, about seven and a half million uh, people to about 300,000. But still, the United States was never able to raise enough men for a successful invasion of Canada. And we tried several times in the course of the war to invade Canada. But the nation's problems, or the national government's problems, went beyond just numbers. The Army lacked a trained professional officer corps. Commissions were highly political. William Winder was a political appointment. Now, 
Congress had established the Military Academy at West Point in 1802, but by 1812, West Point had only graduated 89 officers. And at the time the War of 1812 erupted in June of, eight, uh, in June of 1812, there, no one was actually enrolled in West Point. The academy had virtually, virtually shut down. Um, ordinary soldiers received very little training. There was no standardized training manual until the war was almost uh, over. Um, and once the war began, the army would often detach uh, uh, small units from larger units and then rush them in into combat, which meant they had no experience and no training um, uh, uh, maneuvering with larger units or working within larger units. An inadequate administrative system contributed to the army's efficiency, inefficiency. I think this is a remarkable um, uh, statistic. Uh, Thomas Jefferson took office the uh, entire executive branch of the federal government had 130, 130 employees. And, and that's not the White House staff, that's the entire executive branch of the federal government. Uh, Matt, when Jefferson left office, there were 126 employees. Uh, the War Department, when Jefferson became president, had 18 full-time employees. Jefferson was appalled by that bloated bureaucracy. <laughs> and he dismissed one accounting clerk which meant when the War of 1812 began, uh, Madison inherited a War Department with 17 full-time employees. Um, when the war began, the Army supply system collapsed. There was, a, um, there was a, an Army Quartermaster General who duplicated the work of the civilian Commissary General, but neither one of them and no one could keep track of the inventory actually on hand. Uh, on the brink of the war, Madison had asked Congress to create two assistant secretaries of war, but that was a luxury that Congress wasn't going to pay for, and so they said no. When the war began, uh, the Army had no intelligence service, no capacity for st strategic planning, no ability to coordinate multiple uh, armies in the field. There was nowhere to put prisoners of war. There was no national prison system, so the Army had to use state penitentiaries and local jails. I did, a, I did a talk down in Newburn, North Carolina a couple of weeks ago, it's a little historic town on the coast, talked to some folks in the local historical society there who actually had correspondence. The local historical society had preserved correspondence between the, the Newburn sheriff and federal authorities. The sheriff had been responsible during the war for housing British POWs down there. Well, the security was very lax in these local jails and escape, uh, escape was, was common. Um, and meanwhile, the Army struggled to keep its own men under control. About 10% of the regular Army deserted during the War of 1812. And one reason men deserted and one reason that uh, in, in, they refused to enlist is because of the, the supply system and the Army had a hard time paying and clothing and feeding men, so service in the regular Army wasn't very attractive. Um, the, um, now, about 10% of men deserted one of the things I learned, and I, this really surprised me when I, when I discovered this, um, that other men found legal ways out of service. In those days, state courts would often issue writs of habeas corpus to release men from their, from their military obligations. And one ground on which you could be released was if you had been a minor when you, uh, when, when you enlisted. Uh, state courts would often uh, order men released from military service on that grounds. A lack of money was at the root of many of these problems, since the Republicans were loath to impose direct taxes on people. They had relied heavily on import duties uh, on, um, to finance the federal government. Restrictions on legal trade with Great Britain, uh, even before uh, the war began, had cut into those revenues. By 1814, uh, the federal government was virtually broke, unable to make regular payments on the national debt. Illegal trade contributed, uh, continued during the war and contributed to the administration's financial woes. Because Federalist New England generally opposed the war, the British did not blockade the New England coast until 1814, which meant New Englanders could continue to buy British goods and uh, smuggle uh, uh, beef and cattle and flour to British armies in Canada. On balance, the illegal trade drained hard currency out of the United States and contributed to the government's financial problems. For much of the war, the federal government struggled to borrow money 
Uh, most of the nation's largest banks were in the Northeast. They were controlled by Federalists who were hostile to the war, and they were not inclined to, to loan money to the Madison administration. The case of a man named David Parrish uh, illustrates the um, interconnections between illegal trade, government finances, and the war effort. The British were surprised that the Americans never made a serious effort to close the St. Lawrence River, which was a critical supply line for British forces in Upper Canada. Well, they may have owed that bit of good fortune to Parrish. Parrish was a large landowner and merchant in Ogdenburg, New York. Now, Ogdenburg was located in the St. Lawrence River Valley along uh, New York's northern border. And Parrish carried on an extensive illegal trade with Canada. And military operations in his neighborhood would have been bad for business. But Parrish reckoned that he could make money by playing both sides in the war. And he loaned the federal government seven and a half million dollars, which was an enormous amount of money in those days. And in exchange, Parrish apparently purchased a tacit understanding from the Madison administration to keep troops away from Ogdensburg. And in fact, when one regular army officer, a man named Benjamin Forsythe, led some raids from the St. Lawrence Valley into Canada, uh, Parrish apparently used his influence to get, uh, to get uh, uh, Forsythe and his troops removed. Well, money motivated Parrish, but Madison's biggest headaches came from Federalists in New England who opposed the war on political and philosophical grounds. The New England states regularly withheld their militia from federal service. Uh, Connecticut offered recruits twice what the U.S. Army uh, paid if they would join the Connecticut militia in an effort to keep them out of the regular army. Uh, Federalists refused to subscribe to government loans. They bought British war bonds uh, <laughs> and demanded a, a negotiated end of the war. Federalists in Massachusetts even supported, even, even proposed that we just give the British part of Maine in exchange for a peace treaty. They were willing, they were willing to give up their neighbors in Maine to end the war. Uh, and there was a vocal minority of Federalists who simply advocated leaving the Union altogether and making a separate peace with Great Britain. Well, as president, James Madison couldn't overcome all these weaknesses of the early American state. But here, our plot thickens a little. Whatever modern historians think of Madison's performance, he won re-election in 1812, and he remained popular until the end of his performance. Now, he had his critics. You can see that in some of the graffiti. They had graffiti back then. Some of the graffiti that met him when he went back to Washington after the British had burned the city. Um, uh, Early 19th century graffiti is kind of interesting. One, uh, uh, one posting read, James Madison is a rascal, a coward, and a fool. Uh, another uh, scribbler wrote, uh, and this must have taken some time, George Washington founded this city after a seven years war with England. James Madison lost it in a two years war. Uh, but when Madison left office, uh, and for years afterwards, most Americans thought He'd been a model president. Uh, even some of his old enemies treated him charitably. Uh, John Adams said that he thought Madison had added more honor, uh, that's the term he used, added more honor and done more to strengthen the Union than Adams himself, Washington, and Jefferson put together had done as they were president. Um, I think it's a sign of the popular respect that Madison enjoyed that more American towns and counties are named after him than after any other American president. The, um, the burning of Washington didn't deal his reputation a fatal blow, at least not in his day. The British occupation lasted less than 48 hours. The um, federal government quickly resumed um, uh, its normal, if modest, operations. Uh, most people blame John Armstrong, the Secretary of War, or William Winder, the general, for the debacle. And the administration even managed to, 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 to spin the attack on Washington for its own propaganda purposes. Uh, Cockburn and Ross drew a widespread criticism on both sides of the Atlantic for what a lot of people saw as needless destruction of public buildings. Uh, from a military standpoint, the British victory in, in Washington really accomplished nothing, while the American victory in Baltimore did a lot to revive American morale. <clears throat> 
Well, British and American negotiators uh, in Gent, Belgium, signed a treaty ending the war on Christmas Eve, 1814. It was essentially a ceasefire, settled nothing. But, of course, in a final odd twist to this odd little war, as I think most of you probably know, the most spectacular American victory of the war uh, came in New Orleans a few days after the peace treaty was signed. But since most Americans, got new, most Americans on the East Coast got news of the victory in New Orleans before they got news of the signing of the peace treaty in Europe, the end of the war, it seemed like an American victory to them. And Masson benefited from that perception. And, and because very few men had actually seen combat during the war, and most of the fighting took place on the Canadian border, uh, most people's perceptions of the War of 1812 were shaped by what they had heard or what they had read and not by, not by personal experience. So to most Americans, it really looked like we had, we had probably, we'd probably won the war. But, and um, I'm uh, really my last point, the respect that Madison enjoyed also owed something to an older way of thinking about war and about presidential power. Madison and most Americans in his day did not think a president should dominate the nation's politics. Uh, Madison had said during the debate over the Constitution that he did not think that an American president acting within the limits set by the Constitution could threaten the people's liberties. But he said later there were a few circumstances in which the president might be a threat. And one of those circumstances was war. Um, uh, where people would demand a decisive presidential action. Uh, Masson, I think, demonstrated his concern uh, about the abuse of presidential power from the very beginning of the war in his war message to Congress. In the June 1812 message, he laid out his grievances against Great Britain, but he never specifically asked the Congress for a declaration of war. Under the Constitution, a declaration of war was a decision for Congress and Masson was going to defer to Congress. Going back to his days as Secretary of State under Thomas Jefferson, Madison had tried hard to avoid war, but it was not so much because he dreaded the human carnage. When we think of war, we think of Antietam, Verdun, uh, D-Day. We think of uh, mass casualties and attacks on cities. Um, we think of the Blitz, the Holocaust, Hiroshima, Nagasaki. But an 18th century mind like Madison's thought about wars as fought by small professional armies operating within strict rules of engagement, armed with, musket, armed with muskets that made it difficult to hurt anybody beyond a distance of about 100 yards. Or they thought about, uh, they thought about wars fought by militia essentially peaceful citizen soldiers uh, who, who served in short tours of duty to defend their homes. For Madison's generation, wars presented mainly political problems. They were expensive, which meant higher taxes and increasing national debt. And that debt would often find its way into the hands of wealthy speculators who could acquire too much political influence. And military spending encouraged inflation and profiteering and, and financial speculation that, uh, that debased honest labor. And war with its demands for the kind of quick action a legislature couldn't provide could swell the power of the executive. So Madison's popularity endured in part because most Americans in his day thought he had managed the political risk of war just fine. Madison supporters believed that fidelity to principle was as important as more tangible accomplishments. They didn't expect very much from the federal government. The historian Gordon Wood has called the War of 1812 a Republican war that Madison sought to wage in a Republican fashion. He was, his reserve leadership style reflected a Republican commitment to limited government and individual rights. He tolerated his federalist opposition with no censorship, no internments, no military tribunals. Uh, prisoners of war and enemy aliens were treated humanely. Um, and in the end, Americans appreciated Madison's respect for civil liberties. And not only could Madison claim that he had respected people's liberties at home, he had also argued that he had vindicated 
American rights abroad. As the war went on, without really accomplishing very much, it became more and more a war for national prestige, a war to show the world the United States would resist when its rights were violated. John Taylor of Carolina, a, a prominent Virginia politician and member of Congress, said that the War of 1812 was a metaphysical war, a war for honor, like that of the Greeks against Troy. And fighting the war honorably became a kind of a end in itself, a survival with the nation's Republican institutions intact constituted success. And for Americans who lived through the War of 1812, or who grew up immediately after the war, they saw it as the, the War of 1812 as a second war for American independence. And that war, whatever modern historians think, they thought James Madison had won. Thank you. Thank you.